I was actually going to get up here and just start mouthing, but <clears throat> he stole my thunder. All right, so back again with another controversial topic. This one is um, very heavy on my heart. This one um, really has been convicting me for a while now. Um, but I'm just going to let you know, um, this is an extremely debated topic. There are some people who don't even believe that there's racism going on today, and there's some people who don't even believe that there's the idea of race, period. Um, and You're so understand, I'm not even going to be dealing with that, I'm just going to assume that you know that there is racism today and that there's a thing called race because we don't have enough time in fact, we have a very short amount of time to get through all of this content, and this is such a broad category that I think the church has been silent, not this church, but the church as a whole has been silent um, on this issue um, more than it should be. That being said, um, this topic is so, um, so controversial that I would ask you right now to really Humble yourself to hear this message. It is difficult. It is. Um, and, and it's difficult because uh, the racism that we, might be, that we are referring to might be applicable to you. Uh, the, the issues that we are referring to might be applicable to you. And it's going to be hard to get these things because, honestly, it's in our nature, in our sinful nature, to blame, right? That was part of the fall, to immediately, immediately Adam blamed the woman and the woman blamed the serpent. And the serpent was just like, yeah, sure, well, I, I'm at fault. The reality is it's easy to look at other people. It's easy to be able to say that they have the problem when, in all actuality, we have the problem. Now, for the sake of time and clarity and application, we're going to go and talk about white and black issues together. Now, of course, uh, I can, I, I'm speaking in a Russian church, so I can go Russian and Ukrainian, correct? Um, but I do not want to start a riot, number one. Number two, um, I don't know much on the issue, but the Ultimately, these principles can apply to any race and any culture. Um, so whether it is, um, you know, Muslims or if it's about um, uh, Mexicans or whatever, um, there should be the same application given. And, um, but because of this country's history um, and their historical um, racist treatment towards black people and black culture, I think it's important because especially what's going on today as we know about Charlottesville, um, this is an issue. It's still an issue. And I'm going to be de dealing with that mainly in my application at the end. These principles um, are going to be important because um, it, it's just foundational, it's objective in Scripture, and then we can apply it to our lives in many different ways. But I want us to understand something um, real quick, that we have tried to get rid of racism, and I'm just going to be honest, it's not going to happen in the way that we think. Let me, let me explain what I'm saying here. I do believe that, as John Owen told us, that mortification of sin is not only possible, but it is, uh, it is incumbent upon the believer to do it daily, hourly, every moment of their lives. And so I do believe racism can be killed, but I only believe that that's going to be killed through the gospel. I do believe it's only going to be killed when Christians start living according to their calling, But there's this idea, and I hear this all the time now, whenever they see, well, this happened a lot with Charlottesville, they said, well, uh, I can't believe this is happening in these modern times. You guys heard that? In this modern day. Well, what did you think? Do you think that because we have technology, that we have education, that we have uh, government funding, that all of a sudden sin goes away? 
But we have kind of expected government and just time and sophistication of our society to be able to take away racism. But that's not the answer, is it? That's not. Modern times does not deal with it. Education does not deal with it. We, we've tried to... Um, We've tried to say that race doesn't exist or say, oh, I'm colorblind. You know those people, right? You might be one of them. I don't see race. Well, I don't see color, and I don't see... Man, you are colorblind. You are so tolerant of everyone that you just see balls of flesh walking around. I don't see gender. I don't see race. I don't see people. I don't see... It. Like, it's like, what do you mean? And so what we've done when we say, yeah, I don't see race and I don't see culture, I don't see anything, what we've done is just say, hey, you know what, stop bringing up anything, stop bringing up your race or your culture, your history, your past, or who you are. We're all just blobs of flesh and we just need to just basically ignore one another. Not bear with one another, but ignore one another. Hey, this is important to me. Well, I don't see that that's important to you because I don't see race, I don't see culture, I don't see anything like that. We have to be careful that the, this idea, and by the way, this idea has been spewed from the world in order to be more acceptable and, and to be seen as such a tolerant person. That doesn't make you more tolerant. This makes you more confused. It makes everyone confused. Because instead of dealing with each other and bearing with each other and loving one another for their differences, we say there's no such thing as differences. There obviously is confusion about this subject. I want to give a definition for racism before we even jump into this. So it's, so it's clear what we're trying to deal with, what, what, what we have in mind, and I think that's important. Def, the definition of racism is this, that what I have, elevation of one's race, it's one's elevation of, uh, sorry, it's an elevation of one's race over another, whether explicitly or implicitly, and whether personally or systemically. And of course, you can add to that if you would like. I do not care. But let me just say that again. It is someone who is putting one race over the other, whether explicitly or implicitly, right? Explicitly, uh, people say, ah, there's, there's, there's no racism today because, well, there's no lynching and there's no, uh, um, uh, there's no slavery and there's no segregation. And, and I honestly, that last part, I would... I would disagree, but I want you to know that that right there, all these, these blatant examples, that comes from the heart, right? That the slavery and the segregation and the hating, uh, 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 whatever, the public beatings of, of the black race was solely because of our sinful hearts, that we have elevated ourselves over another culture for our own, our own purposes, our own gain. It doesn't need to be explicit. It can be implicit. It can be in our minds. It can be in our hearts. It could be, quote, uh, um, it could be comfortable. It could be safe. Not hurting anyone. We could say racist terms and we don't need to say it in front of someone who is a different race than us, and we can just say it privately, and of course, that's not racist, right? We have to be careful with our idea of race and, and racism. And by the way, uh, I do believe that there is racism systemically in this country, but for the sake of time, I think it's important to deal with things personally, how we deal with one another, how we deal with the world, how you and I as believers, how are we going to treat one another? How are we going to treat non-believers? How are we going to treat enemies? How are we going to treat people who are different than us? That's what we're talking about today. Ultimately, racism comes from a heart that is proud. Racism elevates oneself and looks and picks at little things to be able to justify his pride. That's, that's real. We see this historically, right? Not only in scripture, but we see it historically. Man has, white man, when they 
brought slaves over. We constantly made black people and uh, Native Americans as savages. That was our goal, that we needed to tame them, that we needed to control them, that we needed to wipe them out, or else they would kill us, or they would uh, come after us. So we said, we cannot educate them. We must not let them congregate in groups. They must not uh, be taught so much language. Because if they did, if they grabbed hold of education or learned to organize themselves in groups, that they would kill us. You see, coupled with pride, racism is about fear. And it's natural that way. Pride is first. And you get your elevation of pride. And then when somebody tries to take away your position, you get fearful. Because you see your shortcomings, you see your failures. Pride. It's in every single one of us. It's a temptation that all of us struggle with daily. But instead of dealing with pride, we say that, Racism doesn't exist. It's like to say pride doesn't exist. Or that, imagine you have this arrogant man and you say, well, over time, his arrogance will just go away. You would not think that it is a viable solution to kill that sin. But when it comes to racism, when it comes to dealing with one another, we think that time or even just just saying that it doesn't exist is going to make it go away. That's not how problems are dealt with, church. That's not how problems are dealt with. Our solu- if the problem is within the heart, then the solution must, be, must go to the heart. And the only thing that can go to the heart is the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he has done on that cross for us to redeem us to a holy God and to each other. It is a solely a spiritual work that can change this racist, sinful heart. In order to understand racism and in order to understand this issue of pride and how God deals with it, we're going to have to go throughout Scripture. We're going to have to get a comprehensive view of it. The first thing we want to look at is man's separation. Man's separation. So if you would like, if you could, turn with me to Genesis 3, and we'll look at this together. Genesis 3. Man's separation. Man's separation. Now before, let me, let me say this real quick. Um, I know how hard this issue is. Um, my wife, um, who is here actually, which is lovely, um, is black, and for the first time, like when, when we were together, uh, she came from um, Southern California. She came from the valley, and she was, when I met her, a valley girl, which I didn't like. You guys know what a valley girl is, right? And I'm like, oh, she's like that, right? You know, that kind of talk. And she was like, whatever, and all that stuff, and it drove me crazy. But I, we started talking about it, I started dealing with it, and uh, one day she was like, um, she was like, you know, I'm, I'm sick of trying to please people. I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, I'm sick of trying to be this way. And I said, okay, that didn't tell me. What are you talking about? All right. And she was like, all right, so uh, when I was, I grew up in Oxnard. And Oxnard, was it Mexican mainly? Yeah? Okay, it's Mexican and black. When she would hang out with her Mexican friends, they were like, all right, you're too black. She would hang out with her black friends. They would say, you're too white, too light-skinned, which is colorism, which is still a form of racism. She would hang out with her white friends. They'd be saying, hey, you're too black. So she was too much for anybody. She could not accept who she actually was because no one would accept who she was. She was just confused. And then one time she said, hey, you know, babe, I want to be, I just want to be how I grew up to be. I just want to be who I am. And I said, do it. And then all of a sudden she got this dashiki on. She had her afro and she's like, let's do this. And I was like, what the heck? (laughs) I said, I was not ready for this. And I was, my, she'll, she'll testify, she'll rip me up, and it's good. I just was like, this is wrong, 
this is not biblical, this is blah, blah, blah. And really what I was saying is this makes my white culture uncomfortable. <laughs> you can't be yourself. And we, how long, we had some debates for a long time, right? Basically to the point where I was like, what the heck? I said, be yourself. She was herself. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you can't be black though. You have to be like me still. And the very people that she was saying, oh, they won't let me be themselves, she found it in her husband. What I'm saying is it's easy to, be, to go along in this racist culture and not even realize it. But the one question we have to ask ourselves is, do we love one another? Not just the church, but one another. Genesis 3. We know that in Genesis 3, well, we can say that God created man for his purposes. In Genesis 1, 26, God created man in his own image to bear his image unto the world, to look like him, to obey him, to follow after him. But in Genesis 3, God said you can eat from, any, well, in Genesis 2, God said you can eat from anything in the garden except for this one tree because if you do, you'll die. And of course, Adam and Eve, uh, well, Eve, when she looked at the tree and noticed it was good to the eyes and good for food and able to make her wise, she took of it and ate it. Where her purpose and Adam's purpose was supposed to be dependent on the God who made them. When they take, took of that fruit, they abandoned God and, first of all, abandoned, abandoned God as their authority. They abandoned God as their authority. God told them to, uh, gave them a command, but they rejected that. We rejected the idea to bear God's image. We were called to reflect God. But in Genesis 3, why don't we look at verse um, 5. Satan says, For God knows that in the day that you eat it, eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that, that lie that you will be like God, that really took Eve and it took man, it took Adam as well. That we could be like God. God told us we had to be like him, so we have to be like him in every way, right? Well, we can't. But this idea to bear God's image, not to be God, but to bear God's image into the, unto the world, that was our job, that was our responsibility. But when man and woman sinned, they rejected that idea that we were image bearers, but more, we were gods ourselves. God gave us life. Look at um, Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. See, man was supposed to be dependent on God for everything. In fact, he was nothing. He was literally dust without God's breath, without God's life. And when God gives them the command in Genesis 2, he says, do not eat of that tree or you will what? Die, because you were going to be separated from the life. You were going to be separated from the life source that you were given. God created man to be dependent upon him and man rejected that. In other words, man now was separated from God after he took of the tree. He started to see his nakedness. He started to see his sin and God kicked him out of the garden and said, you can't come back. We cannot have fellowship. So man rejected God as authority. Man rejected God as their purpose. And man rejected God as the very means to live out that purpose. But not only this, when a separation from God happens, the elevation and the exaltation of our self starts to come through. And man then began to be separated from his brother, from other men, Cain and Abel. We know the story, <coughs> excuse me. There's Cain and Abel. Here's Cain. Cain says, all right, here's some fruit and some, some uh, stuff and some vegetables. Offer it before the Lord. 
Here's Abel. He says, here is a, a lamb, sacrifices it before the Lord. God says, Cain did it wrong. Abel did it right. He listened to me. That's, that's your guys' problem. You guys don't listen to me. And instead of listening to God, there was this pride that swelled up in Cain. Because God was saying, you didn't listen to me. And he goes, who are you? Who are you to listen to? I did enough. And pride swelled in his heart. And he saw his brother, and his brother offered this before the Lord, and he began to hate his brother. He began to get jealous of his brother. Why? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous, he was jealous. His brother had something that he didn't have, and he didn't like it. So he killed his brother. And God says, why have you done this? Why is your brother's blood calling out to me? And Cain's response is very simple. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I in charge of him? Do I need to care for him? And the answer is yes. But since the fall, man has been separated from, from their brother, from mankind, and says, do I really need to care for them? I mean, I've got my life and my issues, my family, my, my resources, my, my money, my job. I have to care for these things. I have little time to care for each other, for other people, especially sinners and enemies of the gospel. Why do I have to care about them? <clears throat> and so we see from creation that the fall was all about man being separated from a holy God and secondly, man being separated from man. We've been separated from man in that we have rejected love for our fellow man. We can see that in verse 6 of chapter 4. Then why are you angry, said to Cain, uh, sorry, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Why are you angry? Why do you hate your brother? Pride. Pride. <clears throat> let's, be, let's bring an application. One thing I hear all the time, we have a, uh, a black man gets shot by a cop. And immediately phrases get thrown out. And you already know the phrases. Black lives matter. Blue lives matter. All lives matter. Right? Agreed? Are you alive? You guys don't want to nod your head? Are you going to just condemn yourself just by a nodding? <laughs> someone says, black lives matter. And someone immediately says, ha, no, all lives matter. Don't you get it? All of us do. Because apparently when a black person dies and they say black lives matter, what they're really saying, no other lives matter but the black life. That's what they're saying, right? Obviously. Are we so wrapped up in getting the correct answer that we have trampled on our brother to get that right answer. No, 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 they don't. It's not just black lives. You're wrong. Imagine my wife comes to me and she says, babe, you hurt me. And, and I don't feel like you love me. Well, the heart is deceitfully wicked and above all else deceitful. You can't trust your heart, babe. Your emotions are wrong. I love you. Don't doubt it. Get out of here. <laughs> you would say, Ooh. that's not going to last long. You know why? Because that's not loving. Yeah, it's what we do all the time. It's what we do all the time. Instead of caring for our brother who's dying or even that a soul could possibly be in hell, instead of grieving and mourning, what we say is, ha ha, you've got the wrong answer. 
And then all of a sudden, blue lives matter. And we just became interested in Smurfs. <laughs> blue lives matter. And so what we have is, when a cop dies on Facebook, this is Facebook, this is Facebook fighters. Um, on Facebook, if a cop dies, what do we say? We go, blue lives matter. And, and we have everything to say about it. And then when a black person dies, the same people, silent. Silent. But I care about all lives. You heard my argument before. Your argument means nothing. Show me your actions. You're not loving your brother. You're not loving mankind, yet it's the very reason why you're here. You have trampled over someone just to get your argument right. Foolishness. There's no love there. There's just pride there. You see, you can pat yourself on the back, sleep better at night because you were right. Heaven forbid you could be wrong. But we've also re rejected the responsibility for man, just like Cain. We see these people dying, we see suffering, and we go, well, they did something to deserve it. And I, I'm going to be real because not only, listen to me, not only do I hear these racist things being said, I hear it in this church. I've had the conversations with the people in this church, and these are real life conversations. They're lazy. Black people are lazy. They could get a job, they could do all this, but instead they sit at home and just complain and whine and then and they dress like thugs and they go into crime and then of course they're going to get shot because look at the way they dress. You are so lovely. Don't want to get mad. But I do want to get mad at this sin because the hypocrisy is just ridiculous. You look for a reason for the cop to shoot someone. Instead of saying, maybe this is an issue. You think that cops are infallible. They have the same, just because you put on that blue costume doesn't mean that immediately you're infallible. But you look at your, these people and you look for a reason why. They died because of this sin, and it's always sin. And by the way, it's most likely that your culture, their culture is different than yours. Now, let me say this. <clears throat> this reminds me a little bit of what happens in John 9. So let's go to John 9. Man, I'm supposed to be done in 15 minutes. <laughs> no way. <clears throat> Hope y'all ate. <laughs> Sorry. I'll try to be done soon. Okay. John 9. <clears throat> John 9, verse 1. You guys there? Yeah? Okay. As he passed by, he saw a man blinded from birth. Okay? Listen. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he would be born blind? Now, Jesus' response is, well... You know, it's not for either. It's just for God's glory that God could be magnified in this man's life. No, I don't want to go that far. But I do want to go with the heart of these disciples. What made him this way? Is it his fault? Or is it someone else's fault? We could say the same thing with the death. Why are so many people dying? They obviously did something to do it. They obviously were some, they, they must have done something. And instead of saying, well, maybe it was someone else's fault, it's immediately the black life. And then you wonder why they say black lives matter. Because instead of saying, well, this is somebody who died, we should mourn. Instead, you're saying, good, justice was served every single time. 
They say black lives matter because maybe they hear from people that they don't. Maybe. Are we so hard-hearted to just spew our political view just so that we can trample our brother? This breaks my heart, but even more, it breaks God's heart. Because God intended for man to be close with him, to be united to him, to follow him, but not only that, by that same grace and power to love the very people that he created, um, um, the, the, to love the very people that were supposed to multiply on this earth. God wanted man to love him and then he wanted man to love man so that man might see God. But I doubt and I truly, I honestly can tell you I am not seeing that with my white friends. The theological ones. We give the great position, but we do not love. Well, the solution to racism is easy. It's the gospel. Oh, and we as white people love that. It's the gospel. And what I mean is, yes, it's the gospel that changes the heart, but then we go, well, I mean, we don't really need to care for anybody else. It's the gospel. And we're going to clarify that in a second. The answer is the gospel, but it's much more than that. It's about you and I living out the gospel, isn't it? The solution to racism is this. Christ has restored man back to God and to man. I've said this a thousand times. What are the two greatest commandments in Scripture? Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. What's the second Love your neighbor as yourself, correct? Nod with me. Yes, DK. Uh-huh. Very good. Upon those two laws hangs what? Well, do we know this one? All in the law and the prophets. Remember that? So, man has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Man has transgressed against God's law, correct? 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 All have broken God's law. In other words, all mankind has broken God's command to love him and to love others. Right? That's it. That's what the, the whole 613 laws are, are about. It's about love God or love people. And since the fall, there is one thing that man has not done. And love God and love people. And we needed someone to come down to fulfill that purpose, to fulfill the law, not to break the law, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Because before a holy God, mankind has this problem. You haven't loved me and you haven't loved your neighbor. So you have a problem. Unless you can, first of all, restore the relationship, we got a problem. The way Jesus is sin is death, and it's an eternal death because I'm an eternal God, and that's what you're going to get. But Christ fulfilled the law, didn't he? Every bit of his ministry you look, and he's always depending on God. People always ask, well, why did Jesus pray? Well, dude, he had to fulfill the law, didn't he? He had to be completely dependent on God. The moment he decides not to pray, the moment that he fails to fulfill the law, that's the issue. Jesus, throughout his ministry, is loving God and loving people, loving God, loving people. Even when he's dying on the cross, he is loving God and loving people. He has fulfilled the biggest problem. We broke the law. We needed someone to restore us back to God, back to man, to fulfill the law, and God did it. Namely, Jesus Christ, when he took on flesh, loved God and loved man perfectly. Secondly, man and God were enemies. Turn to Romans, very briefly, Romans 5, 10. We all know this one well, right? Romans 5, 10. For if while we were, what? Ah, 
enemies. Enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Ladies and gentlemen, not only were you in a bad position with God, but you were his enemy. We didn't want God, and honestly, because of our sin, God was not wanting to, uh, not wanting us in that sense because of our sin, but in the same sense, he wanted us to restore that relationship. We were enemies with God, but in that same passage, though we were enemies with God, God, we were reconciled to God through his death, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, amen? Man, that is amazing news. The problem is, yes, you've been separated from God. You separated from his authority. You stopped caring what he had to say. You, you lived your own life. You did whatever you, whatever you wanted in your life. But the reality is, what Christ does is he restores you back to God, reconciles the two parties, and then makes you back accountable to God and obedient to God. Does that make sense? That's what we do. That's why Christians now can obey. That's why Christians do obey is because we see God as God now, right? We see God as who he is. Before, we thought he was something to trample on, something to spit, out, spit on. But now through Jesus Christ, he has reconciled us to himself so that we can be one with him and we can obey him and honor him and listen to him and follow him. But even more than that, it wasn't enough. See, this is where we stop with the gospel. See, if the, if the law was just about how to love God, then it would have been fulfilled, but that's not it. It's also God tells us to, uh, that we have failed to love God and love people. And so Jesus not only loved God, but he also loved people. And not only that, but he's also restored us to people. 1 John. Let's turn to 1 John. Not John. Second John, not third John, not Sean John, first John. First John 3. First John 3.10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Pay attention. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. If you do not love your brother, and you go, well, <laughs> I love those who are Christian, that's not what it's saying. If you are not loving your neighbor as yourself, it shows that the God who is love isn't in you. Hear me? Picking up what I'm putting down? If you're not a believer, if you're not in Christ, and Christ is not in you, you cannot love because you're too fixated on loving yourself. Society tells us we need to love ourselves. No, that's natural. You do it anyways. We need to love people. People say, you need to love yourself before you can love people. It's garbage. You already do love yourself. Done. Moving on. That's why you get upset when people say you're not that great because you think you're pretty great. <laughs> Those who are not of God don't love their brothers, but look at verse 11 through 12. For this is the message we have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain. Uh-oh, snap. We got back to Cain. Not as Cain who was of the evil one who slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his, brother's deeds were, uh, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Brethren, when God is in you, we should love one another. Amen? Amen. It is such a simple concept. We say, oh, I love God. But if you love God, you must love people. You cannot love God and not love people. You have great theology. You have a great understanding of God. But you're more in love 
with the theology than the God of that theology. And because of that, you love the idea of loving man, but not the man next to you. You pick and you poke and you say, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like this, but if he just fixed his life and came to me, then we can actually have some fun. We can actually be friends. We can actually have some fellowship. And by the way, isn't that how we treat black Americans? If you dress a certain way, if you talk a certain way, if you act like us, you're more than welcome to come. But if you don't, back off. Stay on your side. Segregation. Listen, if you believe in Christ, if you come to Christ and say, I'm a sinner, I'm in need of a savior, I'm in need of a savior because you're a holy God and I'm under your wrath, I need your justification, I need your blessing, I need you just to take my sin away and embrace me and call me your own and I want to follow you and I want to obey you, I want to deny myself, pick up my cross daily and follow you. If you do that, you'll get God and you'll get man, you'll get each other. But it's only from this problem. So we have the problem of pride in our hearts. The only way to restore it is if God takes the pride out of our hearts and says, it's not about you, it's all about me. It's always been about me. See, this is the thing. This is the sweet news of the gospel. If we believe in Christ, he regenerates our hearts so we can do what? Now bear his image. We can go back to that original purpose of loving God and loving man. So we're here on this earth so we can tell people, we, we, we can love those who are in Christ, those who are outside of Christ, those who are enemies of the gospel. We can now see it's not about us that he saved us from the sin of self-glorification. We can now show compassion and understanding to those who are outside of Christ and those who are in Christ. We can show mercy because we know mercy. We can show grace because we, can, we know grace. We can show love because the God who is love is in us. And not only can we, we must. We must. Now, let's go into some implications real quick. <laughs> I'm way over time. <laughs> the implications is this. Not only do we need the gospel to change our hearts, and not only do we need to preach the gospel to people, but guys, we need to now love people. It's not just, just somebody is suffering and then imagine, okay, so here's my wife again. She's crying. She's had a really hard day with our baby. And I come and I go, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We'll see you later, babe. Now, even though that's great, good, that's good news. She's like, what? <laughs> what does that have to do with me? Instead of explaining, I go, maybe you didn't hear me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> That changes her heart. But how does the gospel affect her reality today? And more importantly, how does it affect my reality? I can look at her and say, here, here, you can solve this problem with this, 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 right? That's easy. It's harder to just be like, hey, I just want to be here. I just want to listen. This actually happened this week. It was very humbling. My wife and I got in a fight. That's right. Christians fighting. Me and my wife got in a fight, and <laughs> I woke up, and I was in a fight, and I didn't even know what the heck was going on. So I was like, what? When you're married, you'll understand. Just woke up, and I was in trouble. And I was like, what the heck? So I started talking to Sam, and uh, she's just mad at me, and I was just like, well, I can see where she's wrong, and I had, all, I had my points ready. You guys know this, right? Y'all know this when you're debating with someone, just like, <laughs> with my wife, and uh, I come home immediately, and she's, she's laying down. She couldn't have been in a more vulnerable position, vulnerable position, and I went, and I said, here's your problem. Bam! You know, just destroyed her argument. She didn't say a word, and I went, think about that. And then I walked away, and I was like, what an idiot. And I came back, and I said, I was wrong. I need to listen. Teach me. And then we reconciled. 
it's not that she didn't know that she was wrong, but all I focused on was steamrolling her so that I can get my point across and I can be right. I didn't care about her. I didn't love her at that moment. I loved myself. I loved my peace. I loved my joy. I loved my comfortability. And if she ruined that, let me show you why you're wrong. And that's what we do. We're terrible at this. Here's, here, I have a little fancy, um, I don't even know how to say that, um, Acronym? Acronym? Yeah, thank you. Too many isms. Acronym. It, it's call. We've got to live according to our call. You like that? Thank you. Okay. Um, the first, first C is compassion. This is how we live out the gospel. Compassion. Compassion. That means mourn with those who are mourning, weep with those who are weeping. If they're hurt, sit there and just be silent. Just understand that even if you have the answer, maybe there's a time and place to give that answer. And I'm saying if you have the answer. If. It's not about being correct. It's about loving them, caring for them. You don't have to say your argument when someone is hurting. And guys, I'm talking specifically about all the racism that has happened in this country. And we've seen cops killing African Americans and the response that we see more often than not is just a rebuttal. It's just an argument. Just sit and mourn. Weep. Be silent. Be near and be silent. Show compassion for that is the very thing our Lord did with sinners. This is not applicable to just people of this body because obviously this body is the majority Russian. But show compassion to the world. Mourn with the world. Show them love. It's not like Jesus was hanging around Christian prostitutes. He wasn't listening and caring for their issues because they were believers only. Show compassion. See the differences and show compassion. Number two, ask questions. C-A, ask questions. The reason why we ask questions is because we think we don't have the answer, right? And the reason why we're always giving answers is because we think we have the answer. That's, that's pride. If you really want to love someone who's different than you, understand that their differences aren't bad. Now, here, here's what I don't want, okay? Um, if, you have like, if you have like one... African American at this church, I don't mean like a hundred of you, stand in line and be like, I have questions. <laughs> That's annoying. And they'll leave because we also don't want to treat black people or any different race as like, whoa, you're different than me. You really act like that? Like they're like in a zoo. Like just to observe. No, 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 no. And that is how we treat them. If you're going to ask questions, just go along your way. Hey, have you, have you ever felt racism before? Yes. Huh, I guess I was wrong. Do you feel racist? Do you feel that being at this church, do you feel uncomfortable? Yes. Oh, Okay. Why? Blah, 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 blah. Wait. No. Stop. When you say wait, and you start, put your finger out, put it back in, put it in your pocket, and just go, interesting. <laughs> you don't get it. You just don't. I went, my, my wife's family is from Cleveland. Lovely place. Um, 
And I told you this last time. I went to a whole African-American church. I was the only white dude. I stood out like a sore thumb, a bottle of Elmer's glue just sitting in a pew. <laughs> and I was so, I stood out. And I felt so uncomfortable. But imagine someone said, get over your, your comfortabil- uncomfortability. It's not about you. Oh, okay, sure, but I mean, uh, yeah, whatever. And someone goes, let me tell you what your problem is. Boom, 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 boom. You would say, that is so wrong. Yet that is what we do all the time. Ask questions because you don't have the answer. You may not have the answer. You might be a little racist. Ask questions. Have you ever been affected by racism before? Ask questions. Third, listen. Listen. Yes. When you ask questions, then listen. Stop debating. Stop with your blue lives matter. Stop with your all lives matter. Stop with the black on black crime. Stop. How can you treat someone this way? Well, they deserve to die because, I mean, if you really care about black lives, there's black lives killing each other. So, I mean, what's your point? Really, what's your point? Happens all the time. I have to defend my wife because people say this to my wife, and I'm like, are you kidding? Not again. Stop saying, well, it's justified. Just listen. Your mouth is, can, can set a forest aflame with one spark. Keep it in. Don't talk. Just listen. Hear them out. The reason why I'm even saying these things is these are the, these are the basic fundamentals of all of life, right? Of just interacting with people. It's so simple that we have to go through these things. When you meet someone, say hello, and then say, when they say, how's your day, you say this, right? There's, this is such simple things. Like when someone talks, you listen, um, But we have gone so far in our arrogance that we have to go to the basics. That's right. Show compassion, ask questions, and listen when they respond. But this is how we are. This is the point that we're at. I get it. Some of you are like so fed up with politics, right? And you're like, everything's racist now. Right? Oh, Did I take your next argument out? Oh, man, can't use that one. Everything's racist now. Oh, oh, really? Really? Okay, I'm not saying everything's racist, but I'm saying a lot is. Just listen. Instead of just saying, I I get the reaction that we have where we just get upset because everyone brings up racism. I get it. But at the same time, to say that there's no racism is so ignorant. It's laughable. Listen. Listen to the problems. Lastly, learn. Learn. <laughs> yeah, very basic here. But when you, when you just have your brother in front of you and you just care about what they have to say, it makes so much more. But what I would t- uh, makes so much more of the difference, what I would say is learn. Learn the culture. And please do not come and rush to judgments. Well, that's sinful. This is sinful. Learn the culture. By the way, real quick, I'm not saying all of black culture is a certain way, but if somebody, like someone says, okay, uh, I want to learn black culture, and so they look up hip-hop videos, and then they go, oh, okay, that's black culture, and then they go, in order for me to res- be like them, I got to be like, what's up, and then they put on a do-rag, and they try to be like them. That's not what we're getting at here. You can love someone and be understanding without having to change yourself, Right? Every time people meet my wife and then they meet me, they go, oh, because she's gorgeous and I'm not, it's one, but two, she's so woke um, and I'm not. I mean, I'm just, look at me, I look like I'm from Bob Jones. Learn about oppression, learn about history, learn about segregation, learn about the portrait of the African-American in history of this country and how things haven't changed much. Look, we have a lot of people 
coming up with answers of how to deal with this racism. I think we just need to love each other. What does Philippians tell us? Count one another more important than yourself? If we just got back to the very fundamentals of the gospel and Christian living, we wouldn't have these issues, would we? Just listen to one another, care about one another, show compassion, ask questions, learn, listen, all these things. Live according to your call. And let's love the world, let's love people. Let's pray.